I'm back with an hour of assorted stories featuring monsters in the Rocky Mountains, unsettling humanoid creatures, and ghosts reaching out from beyond the grave in terrifying ways. I'm now reopening paid submissions for just one topic at this time. If you are a forest ranger, or you know a forest ranger, with a terrifying story of the unexplained, send it to me at eeriecast.com paid, and if I narrate your story, I'll send you three cents per word via PayPal. If you've got other scary stories that don't match that topic, you can always send them to me at darkstories.org to have them narrated as usual. Thank you. Also, quick warning if my audio sounds different, I just moved into a new home and I haven't yet soundproofed this office. And one quick update if you saw my community post. I don't have Lyme disease, we're good, and I'm feeling all better now. So, let's begin. The Quiet Being at Wolf Creek from O. Merlin O. In a small town of East Texas, I was about 14 years old. It was the summer of my sophomore year in high school. I usually liked to walk around my neighborhood at night due to it being quiet, and there were no disturbances with it being a gated neighborhood. Not a typical subdivision, though. It was mildly spaced out, and my parents owned a decent nine acres, I think. The owner of the neighborhood had a large portion of land that took up the majority of the gated neighborhood. And there was a creek, called Wolf Creek. It separated half of it. I was used to taking trips through the creek by myself, and occasionally I'd bring friends with me during the day. I would never go in the woods at night, and typically, my night walks, I was by myself. I was always confident going out in the dark but I always had an uncomfortable feeling in the back of my head to keep me from being too comfortable out there. I was fully aware that strange things happen to people sometimes. One night I was on one of my walks, decompressing from the thoughts of my dog passing away that past year. I went to visit her grave. We buried her at the edge of the property not too far from the house. I could see our sunroom light, which I knew my mother left on so it illuminated part of the backyard, which I could see when I came up to the house. I sat down with my back up to our metal black fence that faced the creek. Between the fence and the creek was a dirt road. I sat there for nearly 20 minutes. The air sat still, along with the chirping of critters in the night. Somewhat calming to me, yet that feeling in the back of my mind was uneasy like a quick reminder that I shouldn't be too comfortable. Not long after that, I heard a rustle of rocks from the dirt road just behind me. A chill came over me. It was certainly not what I ever expected to experience in my life. I turned around quick, only to find a still humanoid figure standing there, just staring at me. It had a curious look on its face, its eyes were large and black, and it had a light brown and gray skin color. There was no lip definition, so it didn't look like it had any mouth to it. It was no taller than myself, and I was about 5 foot 10. Its limbs appeared to be bony. It continued to stare at me for what seemed like forever. Finally, at some point, it proceeded to take a step forward, reaching for the fence in front of me. It slightly opened its mouth, like it was going to speak to me. But before anything else could happen, I ran. I ran harder than ever before, with tears rolling down my face. My heart pounded, and my body felt cold, like opening up a freezer door in a warm room. I made it back to my house no problem. I bolted inside, yelling for my dad to grab his gun. Puzzled, he trusted my demand because it was something I would never just run into the house for at night. We power walked outside to find nothing there. No footprints, no tracks in the dew of the grass except for my own boots. My dad wanted to know what was going on. I explained to him what I saw. My mother was outside at the same time, as she was also concerned. They wanted to believe every bit of what I'd said. After all, I was pale in the face like I'd seen a ghost. But my mother tried shrugging it off, saying that I saw some homeless man. But I knew what I saw that night, and I still get chills when I think about it. It was so real, and it all happened so quick. 
To this day, I'm still curious as to what's out there, and it doesn't bother me that we're not alone in this world. Looking back, I wouldn't have mind staying there a bit longer, just to find out what would have happened. But everything in my body at the time screamed for me to run. Regretful Words From I Am MWH In less than a year after the night, I will relate to you, my wife and I lost our jobs, our cars, our home, friends, relatives, and our marriage. I'm grateful we weren't expecting a child, otherwise I'd be afraid we would have lost the child as well. Personally, I've never recovered from that night, or the events that followed. It was 20 years ago. We had great jobs, a great house, solid money in the bank, and we were very much in love looking forward to building our lives and a family. It's not like we always had these blessings. We worked hard to get where we were, so we very much understood the struggles. But once those struggles are behind you and you make solid decisions for your future, they should stay behind you. Well, that's not always the case. Sometimes bad investments will put you under. Sometimes a lawsuit for serious medical issues will deplete your savings until you have to start selling property to get cash to pay bills and stay alive. But none of that happened, and even to this day, 20 years later, my ex-wife still claims not to know why she filed for a divorce. She just felt compelled to do it. But I believe I may know why all of this happened. Now on to the night I mentioned earlier. It was a cold late fall or early winter night, I know this because when I was awakened in the middle of the night, I was under a heavy comforter. This was our thicker winter blanket. My wife had stored the lighter summer linen a month or so earlier. So I'd been awakened. I sensed the air in our bedroom had suddenly changed, as though someone had just walked through the door. My initial thought was that it was just my wife, returning from the bathroom. Yet even though my back was to her, I felt the heat from her body still under the blanket, and I could hear her breathing as she rested comfortably. So it hadn't been her, and we had no children or pets to be concerned with. No, this must have been something else. It felt like there were more beings in the room than there should be. After that, I immediately thought, a burglar. Though there had been no noise, no footsteps or drawers being pulled open that I could hear. The room was quiet, too quiet, and the silence was deafening. That's what bothered me. I'd been in the service and knew the feeling of being watched. That instinct that tells you to look behind you was pushing me, and it was growing more intense by each passing moment. In the past minute, I had not moved. Even so, my heart was picking up pace as adrenaline began to rush in my veins. My eyes were open, and I could vaguely make out my side of the bedroom in the darkness as my eyes adjusted. Due to the thickness of the blanket, I was unable to see the foot of the bed, which is where the sinister feeling was emanating from. To do that, I would need to move. It took all my will not to jump up to see what was in the room with us. Fight or flight was kicking in. Get out of the room or stand and fight because something is there that shouldn't be. Flight was removed as an option, because I would need to grab my wife in an attempt to flee, which was a no-win scenario in my mind. No, I had to do this smartly, carefully, quietly, so I could at least have a marginal chance to gain the upper hand on the perpetrator. In using the thick down blanket as concealment, I carefully moved my hand to the bedside drawer and slowly pulled it open just a fraction of an inch at a time to minimize any noise until it was open enough to get my hand inside. From there, I gently reached in, wrapped my hand around the grip of my 9mm, and pulled it back under the covers with me. I was quite proud of myself for not knocking the gun all over the drawer, giving away my intent and my increasing fear. I couldn't just pop up and start firing blindly. I would need a second or two to acquire my target, and assess whether to fire or not. I mean, just beyond our house walls are the neighbor's walls to their bedrooms. I could likely hit one of them if I fired like that, so I would need to make darn sure what I was doing. 
If the perpetrator was armed, he'd likely get off the first shot, while I needed to find him first. I may die this night, I thought, but I wasn't going down without a fight. I calculated the best thing for me to do, which was to sit up quickly, clear the heavy comforter, as it certainly would be an obstacle for me, and draw down, low at first, scanning the room, then determine my actions from there. So that's what I did. But when I rose up, there was nothing there. Nothing at all. I saw nothing in the darkness beyond the foot of my bed. I could make out the walls, ceiling, the few hanging pictures we had, grateful for the dim moonlight coming through the window blinds, but nothing else. Yet the feeling persisted that there was something there. Shaking my head and hoping for more clarity, I backed up against the headboard to stable my position and look again, gun directed down at the foot of my bed. I glanced at my wife, who was next to me and still sound asleep. I began questioning myself, uncertain of what I was feeling. It was when I shifted my eyes back that it came into view, directly in front of me, no more than five feet away. As my body shuddered in initial surprise, I raised my gun, finger on the trigger, and began to pull, the hammer moving back slowly. Fire or don't fire, I thought. And the second it took for me to decide, that feeling of being watched, though looming heavily earlier, was now gone. My heart beat, but it wasn't thumping away as before. That thing, whatever it was, was still there. It was dark. Not the room, but that thing. And it wasn't a man. That much I did know for certain. It seemed to be using the dark in the room as its camouflage, but it was a shade or two darker, which is likely why I didn't pick up on it during my first assessment. It was cylindrically shaped, with what appeared to be a head, and I estimated it was about six feet tall. But that may not be right, since I couldn't see its legs, if it had any, due to the foot of our bed blocking the floor. And even though it stayed in place, it was moving, or at least the sides of it were. It seemed to me at first like a blackened, but still partly transparent jellyfish, with slow-moving wings, waving up and down, hovering in place. I swallowed hard, making certain of my grip on the handgun. I wanted so badly to pull the trigger, but I didn't. What do you want? I demanded to know. I received no response, no reaction whatsoever. My actions and voice seemed to stir my wife. I needed her to see what I was seeing, so that I would know I wasn't completely losing my mind. Using my leg, I nudged her as best I could. Baby, wake up. Wake up, please. I tried to present a strong, controlled atmosphere for what she was about to wake up to. I even remember saying to myself, man, I hope she sees this. Not that I would wish this terror upon anyone, but it would be a little reassurance that I was actually seeing this, and that would ease my mind. What do you want, honey? She asked, dazed as I encouraged her to open her eyes, but not to panic. As I stared down the entity, from the corner of my eye, her blinking gaze landed on my face. Then her eyes followed to my shoulder, my arm, and eventually the firearm. What's going on? She asked as she trailed the barrel of my pistol to eventually what I was aiming at. Without hesitation, her eyes widened and she scrambled to pull her legs in and crab walked her back against the headboard right up against me. If she were any closer, we'd have been sharing underwear. She grabbed my arm, causing me to release one hand for my weapon, and I moved it to her leg to pull her in closer for reassurance. What is that thing? She screamed. I took a bit of satisfaction in her response, knowing now that she saw it too. I was relieved I wasn't crazy. It's okay, I said as calmly as I could. Of course, I didn't know if I really had anything under control, but I needed her to think I did, so she wouldn't panic any more than she had. As my arm now lay across her chest, I could feel my wife's heart pounding away at the back of my arm. After a brief pause, I tried again. Who are you? What do you want? I inquired to the thing in the dark. 
Still no reaction at all, nothing. It just continued to hover. Though I was calm, the lack of reaction from this thing was unsettling. Babe, what is it? Is it a ghost? My wife asked, a little more calmly this time. This, to me, meant what she was seeing wasn't a man or even human for that matter. I'm not certain. I've been trying to find out for a couple minutes now, but it's not really responding, I told her. Then my wife made a bold move in the funniest way. Shoo, whatever you are, shoo, just go away. She said almost in a whisper as she made a shooing motion with her arm and hand, like you would a fly or a bee. I had to give it to her. At least she tried something instead of nothing at all. Our patience was wearing thin, and my wife was shaking in fear like a leaf in high wind. Honey, it might be a ghost. I mean, it could even be a demon. It needs to go. You need to get rid of it. Get rid of it, she said, semi-calmly, but definitely directly with a tremor in her voice. By my estimation at this point, it had been nearly five minutes that I'd been staring at this thing floating in our room. As I'd stated before, that being watched feeling, that usually comes with some level of fear, had disappeared. I no longer felt threatened by it, whatever it was. Because of this, I considered approaching the thing. Maybe it was tangible and would respond to touch. Then again, I doubted my wife would release her death grip on my arm long enough for me to do that. So I stayed put. And though it may have been a tactical error, I removed my finger from the trigger, putting the hammer to rest. Well, I thought, it won't respond to questions. Maybe it will respond to a command. But what does one say to a ghost or demon? I'd seen on TV somewhere one of those ghost chaser programs that if you instruct a spirit to go away and you really mean it, sometimes it works. However, my wife just tried that and it didn't fare well. Maybe she lacked conviction in her words, lacked a sergeant's voice, like the one I used in the army. Not the loud, forward march voice, rather the cold, calculated, quiet one. The voice that meant if the situation doesn't change immediately and drastically, some real serious business is about to go down. That kind of voice. I hoped it would work, because my next line of action would be to call the police. The police had never been to our neighborhood, let alone to our home since we'd been here, and I certainly didn't want to be the laughingstock or subject of conversation over summer barbecues with the neighbors for the next 10 years because I called the cops for a ghost. To avoid that, a command was definitely worth a try. With that thought, I put my mind back there, back in the service. I cleared my throat, tightened the grip on my handgun, and uttered these focused words. You're no longer welcome here. This house, these souls are not yours. Leave. Now. There was no doubt in my mind. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant with as much conviction as my mind and heart could fathom. And the snap of a finger, no, the blink of an eye, because that's what I did, it was gone. Poof, just like that. My wife immediately let out a sigh of relief. Her body relaxed, and I felt like a hero. Needless to say, we didn't get much rest for the remainder of that night. So both of us went to the kitchen for coffee and discussed what had happened. It was mostly conjecture, as neither one of us knew what it was. We were just grateful it was gone. When morning arrived, my wife had a friend of ours, an ordained minister, over to conduct an exorcism on our home. That thing was never seen again. I wish that was the end of this little adventure, but I know now it was only the beginning. If you'll recall at the beginning of my story, I said in less than a year after this night in question, we lost everything. And there really was no cause for that to happen. It just happened. Everything we'd worked for was ripped from us one way or another, even our marriage. There's no need for details, but it was as though our life together never existed. I've contemplated it a million times in my mind, pondering the what-ifs and the what-nots over the past 20 years. What was in the room with us that night? How did we lose everything so quickly? 
There must have been some correlation between the two, it's only logical. And that always leads me to the question, did we exercise a demon from our home that night, or did we evict an angel? You decide. The Creature in the Clearing From Koalas.co This experience is why I never go outside at night alone. I live in Canada, and I moved to the countryside recently to get away from the city. It's been almost three years without incident, but in the past three months of posting this, things have begun to happen. I live on 103 acres of mostly woods, with paths, trails, and all that good stuff. My house sits in the middle of a clearing, and a stairway leads up to my front porch. Off to the left of the stairs, walking from the door, is the grassy part of the clearing, with trailers filled with my grandfather's things. The main floor and the basement. Now on to some of the things that happen. I'll wake up in the night and go to the kitchen, which is close to my room, just across the hall. Keep in mind, the whole house is an open concept for the most part. Anyway, as I pass the living room, there's this huge thing. Not a person, not an animal of any sort. It's a no-face creature, about nine feet tall. No arms, no legs, no ears, no facial features. It seemed to be just floating there, staring at an outdated world map. That was extremely creepy and bizarre. On other occasions, from the corner of my vision, I have seen things I like to call wisps, like small shadows fluttering past. Now here's why I'll never go outside alone at night again. I typically listen to the night creatures on the porch, and I go inside after a few minutes. However, on one of these occasions, something grabbed my ankle on the poorly lit stairs. When I felt it happen, I moved to the front door faster than I thought possible. Before going back in, I happened to glance out at the clearing. I saw this thing. It was as tall as the trailers. You know, the type she put on the back of the 12-wheeler trucks. It had the head of a deer and the body of a person. This thing also had tusks and glowing red eyes. Quickly, I went inside and locked the door behind me, and I hid under some blankets. After a few minutes, I heard this strange noise, and my cat ran to the window. I gathered the courage to uncover myself and look. My heart sank. There are some bushes with a small walkway out my window. What I saw there was a little girl's shadow, but those same glowing eyes. I hid myself back under that blanket. In the morning, I said nothing to my parents. But my brother, however, made my heart stop. When we were alone that next day, he asked me if I'd seen the dear man with red eyes. I asked him what it looked like, he told me every detail of the thing that I'd seen. Then he said it turned into a girl, and it vanished. So now I knew I wasn't hallucinating, and I told him, yeah, I saw it too. We decided together that we'd tell our parents, but they didn't believe us, telling us to stop pranking them, and they went back to eating breakfast. The basement also scares me, mainly because I always feel like I'm being watched in there even if I'm alone, and I swear I saw two red eyes out of the corner of my eye. Nowadays, I turn on all the lights in there before entering the room. My final piece of the story was just a few hours ago as of writing this. I was doing my chores like every other day, throwing out the litter and the compost area, and as I was looking at my feet while walking back to the house, I noticed something weird. I wasn't casting a shadow. I stopped and began to move around, and no matter what I did, I did not see my shadow appear. I laughed at first, but now looking back at it, I have no idea what to make of it. There's something seriously wrong with this place. The Thing Outside My Window From Buffalo 411 my family and I had just moved. We had just unpacked our stuff two nights before. 
My brother and I had an Xbox we both shared, and we were up late playing Call of Duty and watching YouTube until 12.30 in the morning. By then, our parents were both asleep. My brother and I were getting pretty tired as well. At around 1 a.m., we ended up heading to our rooms to go to bed. When I went into my room, I felt something was wrong, but I wasn't sure why, so I thought nothing much of it. After some time, I ended up hearing a weird sort of noise. It almost sounded like a growl. It sent a chill up my spine. Then, suddenly, I had this urge to look out my window. Steadily, I got out of bed, and I approached my window. I hesitated to open my curtains to look out, but after a moment of just standing in front of the curtains, I did open them. There, standing at the end of the street, only about 100 feet in front of me, I saw this massive black humanoid figure with white, glowing eyes. At first, I thought it was a broken lamp post, but as reality set in, I froze in fear. As I watched it, it got down on all fours and began to walk closer and closer to my window. Eventually, it was standing just under my window and staring up at me. As it was so close, I could make out its features. It had a mouth with pure white teeth and a very muscular body. After a couple of minutes of just standing there, it got back on all fours and ran off back into the woods. That was the first and hopefully the last time I'll ever see that thing. It lives in the trees behind my neighbor's house. From Travis the Hunter. This happened a while back. I'm still scared to even remember this event. I came home after a road trip from my cottage, and everything was fine for a few days. But after that, things changed. My family and I were eating dinner, and I had to do the dishes afterward, so I began cleaning. I suddenly heard a slight whisper outside the window, like someone was trying to get my attention to start a conversation. I ignored it, thinking it was something else or my paranoia. I often get scared easily. Later that night, when I was playing some Tony Hawk on the PS2, I heard the same whisper again, but louder, like a small child would do to get their parents' attention. I paused my game and waited for the noise to come again to make sure I wasn't hearing things. Then I heard it. Come here. It was a raspy voice, and it appeared to be coming from outside the window. I responded nervously with, Why? I don't think it liked that I questioned its command. So it said again, louder now and more aggressively, Come here. It ended with a sort of loud, high-pitched scream. Then I saw these two blood-red glowing eyes in the trees, just behind my neighbor's place. But as soon as I saw them, something leapt down a large cedar tree that was in front of a huge field. The whole neighborhood came out to see what was going on. We lived in a small town. There were like 10 to 20 people out there. I told them what happened and what I saw. They contacted the police about it. They simply told people to be more careful when letting pets out at night, but they did put a camera in the neighbor's backyard to try and capture the thing. So far, it hasn't shown itself, but I still hear the screams back behind that field from time to time. Cabin in the Rocky Mountains of Albuquerque From Anonymous I'm 50 years old and I've been seeing things you might find interesting since I was 11 or 12 years old. I'll start with one of my newer stories. So I used to live in the Manzano Rocky Mountains by Albuquerque with my black lab in 2000 and 2001. It was a log cabin tongue and groove kit house. One side of the roof was asphalt shingles, the other side was cement shingles. I lived at the back corner of Cibola National Forest. It was very cold in the winter. Two degrees from November until April, four feet of snow. Even though I hate the cold, it was one of the neatest places I've ever lived. 
I bought a yardstick just to check the depth of the snow. When I dropped it in, it disappeared. I had to turn my head sideways and stick my arm in the snow to find it. This was just a clearing, not a snowdrift like up against the house. I lived there for one year, and during my time there, something kept landing on the roof. Something big that sounded like it had claws. You could hear those claws crunching on the cement tiles. It made the house rattle. It was very heavy. I carried a 41 Magnum revolver pistol with me inside the house and out. It's an older caliber pistol, but more comfortable to shoot than a 44 Magnum, and more powerful than a 357 Magnum. I would often smoke outside. I had a deck back then that was 50 feet long. Now, sometimes I would hear that big, clawed thing land on the deck, and let me tell you, whatever it was, it could cover all 50 feet of that deck in about four steps. Even if I exaggerated my own steps, I could not cover 50 feet in four steps. I'm six foot two, 220 pounds, and that thing was much bigger than me. On four different occasions, I almost blew a hole in the roof. I wanted to put a 210 grain bullet in it. One of my friends who came to visit every once in a while laughed at me when I told him about this. He said it was BS. But he wasn't laughing when it happened when he was here. He carried a 25 caliber pistol and almost blew a hole in the roof with me. I never actually did shoot through the roof. I was afraid the roof would slow the bullet down too much, and if it hit that thing, it would just tee it off. Then it could just reach around the roof and take me home as a sandwich. I never did actually see it. I'm glad I didn't. I was afraid it might give me nightmares for the rest of my life. The Paranormal and Unexplained Happenings in My Life From Hmm, Okay These are several things that I've witnessed in my earlier years of life, and to the extent of my knowledge are unexplained phenomena. I grew up in a decent neighborhood, and I was about seven when this occurred. My house was a one-story, four-bedroom, two-bathroom house. The backyard had a short but long chain-link fence surrounding it, the place also had a basement. The basement is the center of this part of the story. It had an old flight of stairs leading down into it. That basement always felt off to me, but you could attribute that to a kid's imagination. It always smelled musky and the floor was concrete. Old wooden beams rose from the ground and ran across the underside of the floor. The light was just a bulb hanging from a wire. It had three rooms as well. The first was the largest, it housed the washer and dryer, and a bunch of boxes and the likes. The second had a hole on the back wall, and was half the size of the first and was used as storage. The third was more of an elongated closet. I walked down the old wooden steps one day preparing my laundry, but as I reached the concrete floor, I saw these eyes. Silvery white eyes reflecting light from the second room. Not just one pair but two. Both pairs peered from that black hole in the wall. Come to find out, the house had a history. An older fellow, who I can't remember if he had that house built or if he helped in making it, died on the property. Maybe that had something to do with it. The next story takes place, I'd say a couple of months later, earlier in the morning. I just woke up to complete my daily ritual for getting ready for school. I walked into our kitchen, which had an island in the middle, where it reached a drop leading to the dining area. I just sat down to eat when there was a loud whisper. I didn't hear it clearly, but apparently my mom did. She told me it sounded like someone had said either, You don't know where I am, or You don't know who I am. We still to this day don't know who or what said that. My mom chalked it up to my dad snoring, but I didn't believe that. Fast forward to when I was 12 or 13. My parents had recently divorced. My mom, my sister, and I were all staying in a two-bedroom trailer. In the living room, we had a flat-screen TV in front of a curtained window, a couch, and a love seat. The kitchen was small, and the furthest room was my mom's, which her bed took up most of the room. It was a sunny day. My mom and sister had left the house to run an errand. 
I'd gotten up to get something. That's when I peeked between the gap in the curtain, and standing there was this dark figure. Despite it being daytime, and the fact that there was nothing there to cast a shadow, it was somehow there. Of course, I did a double take, but when I looked back, the figure was gone. Fast forward a while, minding my own business, I hear something. It was faint, but it was definitely there. I checked all the other rooms besides my mom's. When I got to her room, the noise was a lot more noticeable, and it was coming from the other side of her bed. I climbed up on top of the bed and crawled over. I began to listen. What I heard that day I still remember. It sounded like a 40 to 50 year old man breathing. And the breathing was very distinct. Like when you watch a video making fun of nerds or a perverted man. But there was no source. There was no one under the bed. No one outside, no phones or the like. Just disembodied breathing. It was very spooky. Jump forward to when I was 15. We moved again this time to a one-story house out in the country surrounded by woods. And no, the woods were not the creepy part, even at night. This house was a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house, and when you walk in the front door, you've got the living room, then the kitchen, then the hallways to the other rooms. This happened at around 11 p.m. one night. I had my friend over, and we were watching a movie. I think it was Batman. I asked my friend, for the sake of convenience, let's call him B., if he wanted a drink. I was getting really thirsty myself. B wanted a drink too, so I asked him what he wanted. When I got my reply, I went off to get the drinks. As soon as I finished pouring those drinks though, I saw this shadow crawl across the floor. It was human in shape, but a human that was on all fours acting like a dog. Its rear end was sticking up, and its shoulders were lowered towards the ground. Naturally, I thought it was B trying to scare me, which wasn't a far-fetched idea as it was something B was prone to doing. But from where I was, I could see him sitting in my room still, just watching TV. Then I thought, okay, maybe it was just our black German shepherd walking around. Well, our dog was still in my mom's room, the furthest room from the kitchen. The dog would not have been able to get back to my mom's room without me seeing same thing for B. There's no way either of them could get back to where they were without me noticing. Nonetheless, I asked B if he tried scaring me, to which he responded, Uh, no. I was in your room the whole time. Fast forward to me being 17 to 18 years old. I was living at my dad's out in farm country. His house was a double-wide trailer, turned into a house, in my bedroom there, my bed was against the wall. I had a window looking out towards the road and fields. At the time, I was smoking, but I wasn't blazed enough, and I most definitely wasn't smoking anything laced. I was just enjoying the cold breeze coming in from the open window. I should clarify, it's about 9 or 10 p.m. at the time. That's when I saw it. A pale, skinny, humanoid figure. At first, it ran, then it dropped to all fours. I watched it sprint into a ditch on the other side of the road. When I say it sprinted, I mean the thing was unnervingly fast. It moved faster than anything I've ever seen. Thankfully, it spotted my stepmom coming down the open stretch of road. There's no telling what it could have done if it spotted me. When M came in, my stepmom, I asked her if she had seen what I did. M said no, but looked freaked out. Nothing ever came of it just like any of my experiences. To this day, I'm still keeping an eye out for the supernatural. Scratching from under the bed. From Frankie G. This story happened at Mount Hope, Ontario, Canada. I was around eight or nine years old. It must have been maybe 1997. My parents are Hungarian and came here as refugees many years before I was born. So when my parents rented this property in Mount Hope, which had a big backyard, they would frequently have their Hungarian friends come over. Sometimes I would hang out with them, but most times I stayed in the house and watched TV. My mother was Hungarian Roma, so she had a lot of Roma friends come over. They would play and perform music in the house and backyard. 
They'd eat, drink, and dance. My mother never drank, only my father, and he happened to be an alcoholic. One afternoon, my parents and their friends were chilling in the backyard. They made a fire. They also made a teepee stand above the fire that held a big pot of Hungarian goulash soup. They would frequently cook it on the fire. It's actually extremely delicious. Anyway, they were all outside cooking on the fire while I chilled in my room. My room window faced the backyard, and my parents and friends were probably 50 to 60 feet away from the window, closer to the forest. We had a two-acre backyard with cut grass, and behind that grass was a forest. Now, my neighbor who also became close friends with my parents was Native American. Let's call him Bruno. He had a cat that was semi-wild because of the area we lived in, so it clawed me a bunch of times over the years. It was frequently pregnant too, so they named her Mama Cat. So, almost constantly, there were kittens outside the house, due to Mama Cat. I have to urge that not once did we ever bring any kittens into our house. They were always outside. As I was saying, I was in my room alone while my parents and friends were outside cooking on the fire. As I was watching TV, focusing on the audio of the TV show that I was watching, all of a sudden, I began to distinctly hear scratching noises. These noises would come and go. I got a little spooked and thought to myself, where's that coming from? I swear I hear it coming from my room. I stayed quiet, watching the TV, just waiting for it to happen again, but this time I was focusing more on waiting for the scratches to happen than the TV. This resulted in me missing dialogue from the show. I waited and waited until I finally heard it again. I would hear scratch, scratch, scratch. I noticed it would come in threes. I had this feeling of dread come over me, because now I'd confirmed it was indeed happening. I sat there quietly waiting for it to happen again, and there it went. Scratch, scratch, scratch. It didn't sound like kitten scratches. It sounded more like a human fingernail scratching the carpet. I had a bunk bed, and I usually slept on the bottom bunk. So I said to myself, I'm going to put my ear to my mattress and listen to hear if it's coming from underneath my bed. I sat there with anticipation, just waiting for the scratches to happen again. I waited, and waited, and waited. And finally, I heard, scratch, scratch, scratch. They did indeed sound like they were coming from underneath my mattress, giving me the impression something was under my bed. I got more scared than I'd ever been in my life. I ran out the door to the backyard and to my mother, who was sitting on a chair by the fire. I told her in Hungarian, Mom, I heard scratching under my bed. She laughed and said, Honey, you're probably just hearing the scratching that the kittens are making outside. I don't know how, but somehow she convinced me this was the case. I sucked it up and went back to my room. These scratches never happened again that day or any other day after that. However, I did have one more scary experience in this house. I'm not too sure how long it was before this next story happened, but from my distant memory, I feel like it happened not too much long after. Maybe it was just days or perhaps it was the same night I heard the scratches. I'm not sure. I can't remember because it was so long ago. I remember I would lie in bed at night and sometimes I would replay the scratches I heard in my head and sometimes I would still put my ear to the mattress, fearing that I would hear it again, but I never did. The only thing that happened was, I swear, I got poked through the mattress. Like literally, I felt a finger or something poke me. I remember lying there, scared, not moving, trying to pretend I didn't feel it. I said to myself, if someone is under the bed, there is no way they could get their finger to poke me like that through the mattress. The mattress would have lifted up, not stay perfectly flat. It never poked me again. The only explanation I can think of was perhaps it was a form of sleep paralysis hallucination, because not too long after the age of nine, I began to endure horrifying sleep paralysis nightmares. One thing is certain, I was not sleeping, napping, or dreaming when I heard those scratches. 
To this day, I still wonder what it was. A demon? The hat man? Kittens? Or did I just imagine the whole thing? The Hitchhiker From Anther M. A couple of years ago, I worked as a customer service representative for Staples.com, and since their CSR is based in my country, the Philippines, we only do night shift to match the work days in the US. One night, I was waiting for my coworker to pick me up, as she lives just a block from my house and offered me a ride. That night, as her car stopped in front of me, her car suddenly felt odd, like some sort of darkness was covering the car. I shrugged off the feeling and opened the door. As I sat down, I immediately noticed reflecting on the right side of the mirror, a white smoky figure, like from a vape. But the smoke looked like it was a person sitting at the rear end or on the trunk area of the car. I could even see hands covering its face, rather her face. I was shocked, but I didn't inform my coworker because she might freak out. We drove for about four minutes to pick up another coworker, and in that length of time, I kept an eye on the vapor-like figure. She never moved, and she still covered her face. When my other coworker opened the door, I heard the figure crying, a soft but pained cry. I got worried the thing might decide to hop inside the car. But before we moved again, the car stopped, like it just died. My coworker who owned the car said the car was acting up strange since that morning. It would randomly just turn off and make this weird noise. She even admitted that the car felt heavy, like it was pulling a trailer. The thing was, the car was new and she had only picked it up a few days ago. I was planning to tell her that time, but I decided to wait until we got to work. Eventually, the car started, and we drove for another 15 minutes during which we could feel the car slowing down, making weird thumping sounds. As we were about to pass by a mall, I checked on the figure again, and to my surprise, she was gone. I looked outside, and I swear I saw her floating in front of the mall. From her movements, she was slowly sinking down into the pavement. We turned a curve, and I lost sight of her. To my surprise, the car stopped making the thumping sounds, and the atmosphere inside the car felt light and bright. We were almost to work, and before we got there, I let my coworker who owned the car know what happened. And as she had just come back from vacation not too long ago, I asked her where she had driven before coming back to work. She said she had stopped by the White House of Florida Blanca in Pampanga. I'm personally unaware of the place, but I researched and found out the house there was a haunted house, and many folks have claimed to see ghosts there. In conclusion, I had no idea spirits could influence a car like that. Screaming Sue From Mars I live in a small town about an hour away from Chicago, Illinois, my mom told me this story a few years ago, and it still scares me to this day. Here's how it started. My mom, Erin, went to sleep one night. She felt fine. But when she woke up in the middle of the night to a dark room, she looked at the end of her bed, still tired. As her eyes adjusted to the dark, she could now see a tall, skinny old woman standing and staring at her from the end of her bed. She had short, curly blonde hair. My mom was terrified, but she couldn't look away. Then the lady opened her mouth inhumanly wide and said, Wake up! My mom screamed. She yelled for her mother, but her mother didn't come. Then my mom pulled her blankets over her face, lying there, just waiting and waiting until she finally fell asleep again somehow. My mom ended up giving that entity a name. She called her Sue. Sue would go on to scream at my mom many more times before I was born. Soon after I was born, we moved out of that house. But that wasn't the end of Sue, because one day I saw her myself. The first time I saw her, she was walking from the kitchen to my room that was at the end of the hall, and I was passing my mom's open dark room. 
As I passed by, in the corner of my eye, I saw Sue standing over my mom's empty bed, the very same side she slept on. When I told my mom about it, it looked like my mom was about to cry. The second time I saw her, I was coming out of my room and I saw Sue in the doorway, staring forward at the closet right next to me. She seemed almost invisible. So I just closed my door and went to sleep. Since then, I haven't seen Sue again, yet. But when I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm scared I'll see her, and she'll be ready to scream at me, Wake up! Was that a leprechaun? From Silver Bullet 54 Ireland is a country well known for golf, haggis, clovers, green, and well, leprechauns. I know most people don't believe in them, but I do. Part of it is because of my long Irish heritage. My great-grandmother told her daughter, who told my father, who told me. However, just like gnomes, a leprechaun isn't cute, nor is it funny. These nature spirits are very terrifying. In May 2008, I went with some friends on an exchange summer program, which started early, and we elected to go to Ireland. When we switched with the Irish students, one boy said, watch out for those leprechauns. I turned around and asked what he meant. He just gave me a sympathetic smile and walked off without another word. What'd he say? Grant asked. Nothing important, I replied. As we rode on the plane, I kept replaying that comment he made in my mind. I didn't know what made him so afraid of little bearded men with pipes. I ended up researching the lore behind leprechauns. Supposedly, about one-third of Irish people still believe in them. They're said to be smart, cunning, and in some cases, downright hostile if provoked. I kept my mouth shut about that and just made Jacksepticeye jokes with my friends. I decided to rent a camera at one of those Irish shops and got a tripod off Amazon a few weeks before this trip. As we were walking up a hill, Joe suddenly froze. He shouted, What is that? He pointed a few feet ahead at the ground. I looked and saw little white flowers. Those are clovers, I said, helpfully. He narrowed his eyes and said, seriously, I saw a dwarf. The other five of us started laughing. Then suddenly Lauren said, Ow! We stopped laughing. She looked at her thigh and said, Something bit me on the leg. Her left leg had teeth marks. I was starting to get nervous, and Joe said, let's find some lodging. We eventually made it to somewhere we could stay the night in. While we were there, a man glanced at Lauren and said, bit by the men, eh, lass? When we asked what he meant, he scoffed like he couldn't believe how stupid we were. He began to tell us about leprechauns. Now, I didn't know what to believe. He explained, if we don't believe, sit out that camera on the hill at night. He guaranteed the next morning the camera will be down. I decided to call his bluff, and I set up my camera on the tripod at the hill where Joe had been startled and where Lauren had been bitten. The next morning, I woke up at 6am, ate a couple of eggs, then headed up the hill. When I got there, the tripod was in fact on the ground, and the camera had its lens cracked. I checked the pictures, yet everything seemed normal but I did see some small footprints on the ground that I couldn't identify. On the way back from our trip, I crossed paths with the same boy that had first teased me, and he saw my camera. He warned me never to provoke them again. At this point, I'm just hoping someone knocked it over to be a jerk, but then again, what bit Lauren, and how did it get out of view so fast? Maybe we'll never know. The Shadow Person From Dark Hay This story takes place in Costa Rica, a famously haunted place called Duran Sanatorium. This used to be a place where the people sick with the disease tuberculosis would go to have nurses and nuns take care of them. There are many stories of people who passed away there, including a scary story of a nun who took her own life because of all the torment people were going through due to the disease. The mass deaths took a toll on her mind, and she jumped from the third floor. 
Legend has it you can hear the screams of the nun while she falls to her death. I wasn't really looking forward to this trip. I had this feeling telling me it was a bad idea. However, I was a kid and I didn't really have much of a choice. When we arrived, I felt a chill down my spine. It was me, my mom, my dad, my sister, and a friend called Maurice. Soon, my mother was already walking towards the main building, and we were all right behind. Not long after beginning our tour, I could have sworn I heard a woman's voice, and I thought I felt something brush my shoulder. No one else reacted, so I shrugged it off and told myself it was just my imagination. Not much more happened during the exploration of the first building as we just walked down the halls covered with satanic messages and other foul messages on them. We then decided to exit the main building, and we walked towards another building, not too far from the first. By then, I was feeling alright, not really thinking about how scary it was anymore, nor even feeling observed or followed. When we arrived at the second building, the dread returned. I didn't want to go in for some reason, but no matter what, my sister and Maurice made me go in with them. We started to walk down the halls, debris everywhere and the walls were torn down. I remember Maurice explaining to me that the abandoned floor used to be where they would treat the terminally ill patients, and for now, the second floor was used as a housing for people who studied at a nearby college. I nodded and understood all of this. I then walked upstairs and I was met with a locked door, confirming what I'd been told. So I walked back downstairs and joined Maurice in the room he was walking around. My sister was gone then, getting ready to eat lunch. Maurice looked at me and smiled, before passing by and out of the room. I walked right out after him, and a few seconds after I saw him running out of the next room and down the hall, which was pretty dangerous due to all the debris around. I started chasing after him, scared at his sudden reaction, thinking that he was going to leave me there alone to scare me. I wasn't going to let that happen. I called out, Where are you going? To no reply. I could only see him running down the hall and hear the steps going down. So I picked up my pace and I caught up with him quickly. I could see his back now. I saw him turn right and I did the same. I found myself in a room with him. I could see his silhouette. He was just standing there looking at the wall. I laughed and said, you can't outrun me, come on, let's go. I then reached out to grab his shoulder and I was met with nothing. I didn't touch nor grab anything, and yet he was standing right in front of me, but there was somehow nothing physically there. I remember feeling my body run cold, colder than I'd ever felt. I ran yelling and crying, jumping out the window and towards my family and Maurice. They were all out there, already eating, and they looked at me, weirded out, asking, what's wrong with you, why are you crying? I told them what happened, and they told me to stop joking around. Maurice explained how he had come out of the building and saw me running down the hall by myself. He didn't mention there being a person in front of me running down. After this, it's safe to say that I didn't go back into that place. We left not long after, as I didn't want to spend a single minute in there. I don't know what happened. I don't know who or what it was. I just know I saw it, and it ran from me. It was one of the most terrifying moments in my life. Early Morning Encounter From Sunshine I live on a small ranch in Texas that was owned by an older man before us who lived alone. He sadly passed away on the property and we bought it around six years later. We cleared out the old house and barn because they were too dangerous to live in, and we brought a house into the property. I'm absolutely positive, though, that our ranch is haunted. The story I'm going to tell you today is one of many I have to share. One morning in the middle of summer break, I found myself waking up to my sister knocking on my bedroom door. Now, that was already weird considering we both sleep until at least 10pm every day, but I was still in that half-asleep phase where you're witnessing everything that's going on around you but not really registering it. So it was just annoying at the time. She poked her head into my room and smiled. Come on, hurry up and come outside, she told me. I asked her what she wanted and why she was waking me up so early, but she didn't react. Okay, I guess you're going to miss it then, she giggled, 
which my sister never really does. Then she slammed my bedroom door. I heard her run down the hallway and open the front door. Me being curious, got out of bed and walked out to the kitchen, but nobody was outside and the door was closed. I stopped by my sister's room on the way back to mine, but she was fast asleep. I thought she was messing with me, so I told her to knock it off and I went back to bed. It wasn't until after I got back to my room that I realized my sister wasn't blonde, but the girl at my door had been. On top of that, the girl sounded just like my sister. She was even wearing my sister's favorite hat. When my sister woke up, I told her about what I saw and she turned pale. Apparently, the night before, she had the same experience only at 3am, and it was a figure resembling our dad that came to her. He had told her to follow him outside, then said she would miss out if she didn't. It's not the first time we've encountered something unusual, but it was the first time something unusual actually interacted with us. It still creeps me out to think about it. That brings us to the end of this episode of Darkness Prevails. More terrifying stories are on the way soon, so subscribe and smash that like button. By the way, did you know this show is available as a podcast called Unexplained Encounters? Just search for, follow, and rate Unexplained Encounters on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. This show is part of the EerieCast network. Go to EerieCast.com for more scary podcasts, such as Freaky Folklore, which explores your favorite monsters, myths, and mysteries, as well as Redwood Bureau, a fictional horror podcast about an agent on the run from an evil secret organization that captures supernatural creatures and entities. Well, thanks for tuning in. Stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world is a strange one. <laughs>